we could either pay for rent or we could pay our employees. And I thought, well, I can get rid of rent pretty easily. It wasn't until we went remote and about two weeks into it that everyone went, this is awesome. We love it. <laughs> what the heck were we thinking? Are you ready? All right. Welcome to the Remote Work and Travel Show, an interview series featuring ordinary people who have extraordinary travel lifestyles and remote careers. I'm Nora Dunn, and I will be your pilot today on this flight of fancy featuring Chris Dyer. Chris Dyer is the founder and CEO of People G2, where he manages 30 full-time remote employees and 3,000 contractors. People G2 is routinely ranked as one of the best remote companies to work for and has been listed as one of Inc.'s 5,000 fastest growing companies. He made the transition to remote work during the recession in 2009 with stunning success. And Dyer is now a world-renowned expert on remote leadership and productive company culture. His commentary is featured regularly in leading media outlets such as Fast Company, Forbes, Inc., BBC, NBC, and The Telegraph. Dyer is the author of Remote Work, Redesign Processes, Practices, and Strategies to Engage a Remote Workforce. Thank you so much for taking some time out of your remote schedule to join me today, Thanks Chris. Thanks for having me, Nora. I'm excited to be here. So I, I definitely want to start at the beginning, and the beginning is 2009, when you took your company remote in the recession. This makes you a thought leader, because remote work was not even a thing back in 2009. So you, like me, around the same time, probably found yourself stumbling up the learning curve. But I'm curious, what was your inspiration, and what did you learn from this experience? Well, this is when I admit something that I don't like admitting, which is I didn't do it because I had a crystal ball and I didn't do it because I thought it was the future of work. And I didn't do it because I thought it'd be better for our employees. The only reason we went remote was to save money. And that was our starting point because it was a recession. And I thought I need to keep my people. How can I keep my people? And the only way I could come up with that was to get rid of rent and to get rid of the telephone costs and to get rid of all of these things that we couldn't afford to pay for. We could either pay for rent or we could pay our employees, right? We had such a choice. And I thought, well, I can get rid of rent pretty easily. Um, very fortunate that our rent, uh, our lease agreement was coming up like in a month. And I said, let's just not renew, send everybody home, we'll survive. And then when we're ready, we'll come back and we'll get a new building. It wasn't until we went remote and about two weeks into it that everyone went, this is awesome. We love it. <laughs> what the heck were we thinking? And then we began to think about this more inspirationally, right? And figure out how can we keep this? And wow, this is so much a better way to work. But practically speaking, I did it to save money. I did it to save my people. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's a story I do like to share with like CEOs who are thinking about right now. Like, do I keep, do I go remote? Do I go hybrid? Right. And I can usually give them a pretty good argument how it's going to help their productivity, their performance and their profitability. And that gets them excited. And then it's great for their people too, right? But that's what you know, the C-level people are thinking about first. And I'll definitely, I anticipated the pandemic would change the face of office space because once all these companies figured out out of necessity had to go remote, then they, I'm sure, you know, like you in 2009, were looking at the, the bills of their lease, their office lease and the amount of space they had and realizing, eh, this might not be entirely necessary. So this could be a new way for companies to completely restructure and save a lot of money, like you say in that way. So that's a that's an opportunity, I think, a silver lining we can attribute to the pandemic. You did a TED talk called Why Failure Doesn't Suck, which is a great name, by the way. And in that, you talk about how one of the, the very necessary things is uh, for remote teams is open communication. And that's not the easiest thing to create an environment where employees can communicate very openly in a remote work way. So how do you facilitate that kind of the kind of open communication that's necessary to keep the team moving forward in a remote way? Yeah. So I learned the lesson over the years that, you know, if I was loosey goosey, cool guy, hey, whatever works for you guys is fine, that we were going to fail because what employees want is rules. And this drives me nuts because I wish they didn't. But like what anybody wants is structure and rules. And how do I play the game of work here? So we had to come up with very specific things that we reinforce and that we 
we expect from our people that then facilitate high amounts of communication. So I'll give you some examples. One, we all internal communication must be in Slack. So we do not allow email in, just internally, right? If all the, e- all the email addresses are just for people in the company, you, no, it's in Slack. We don't text unless it's an emergency. That way we keep people from feeling like we're going to come after them and, and bug them. I don't know if you heard recent, just recently Portugal passed a law that your boss can't text you after work. Right. Um, and yep. so we are had already put that in place. Like, unless it's an emergency, you shouldn't be texting your coworkers. Right. It needs to happen in Slack. So they have the ability to track it, to see it, to remember it, to have it be. If it's in a room, it's now uh, transparent to the whole team about that what's happening. And if you want to be off, you can just mark yourself inactive and you don't have to be being pinged while you're watching your kid's soccer game or you're at a beautiful meal looking at the Eiffel Tower or whatever it is you're doing that you don't have to be bothered for that bit of time. You can turn off and then turn back on. So that was really important for us to create those rooms, those spaces. And then we curated very, very specific meeting types that allowed us through these different types of meetings to help our employees understand how long will I be on the call what kind of meeting will this be? Am I coming to help? Am I coming to, to teach? Am I coming to debate? Am I coming to learn? Am I coming to shut up and find out what's going on? Like, what kind of meeting are we having, right? Because uh, what I'm finding inside the, of where people are failing with remote work is they just keep inviting people to an hour-long meeting. And it's the same meeting, but it's not the same meeting. And so leaders are really frustrated. Like, well, why aren't my people you know, coming with better ideas and why aren't they telling me what's going on? Because you didn't ask them to prepare for that. You just told them to show up to a meeting and then you magically expected them to have all the answers and have thought through this problem. We didn't didn't tell them what the problem was. No, right? There's very few people who can just BS out of their their mouth, I'm one of them, um, about something just off the top of their head. Most people need time to think about, to research it, and to come up with a plan and ideas and then present something they feel confident about. And so you have to create those good spaces for people. To build on that, people tend to process information differently. Right? Some people are audio, some people are visual, some people are kinesthetic for that matter. So that the communication style when it comes to remote work becomes very important uh, because some people will get the message stronger in one way versus another. How do you address the different communication styles that people have and marry them within a remote team? So we try to ask them to, you know, try to pick the medium that works best for them when they can choose. Um, We also try to make sure we communicate important things in multiple ways, right? So if I want my team to know something very specific, it is very common for me to write it in Slack and then maybe follow up with a video of me talking about it, right? So I have a video and then I would explain it. So if they just want to read it, they can read it. If they want to watch me, they can watch me. We use this a lot for training awesome. videos. So we found that people did want to connect and they wanted to have that you know, moment with a trainer about how to use this new software, but then they also wanted that recorded or they wanted someone to demo that system in a recording like on Loom or or uh, Vidyard or one of those programs. And then w- w- when we surveyed our staff and said, well, why was that important to you? They said, they finally admitted, because I can watch that video over and over again until I understand. And I don't have to feel stupid that I have to go back to the trainer five times because I didn't get it or I didn't understand how to do it yet. And so people would just not tell us. They didn't want to raise their hand and say, I feel stupid. I don't get it. They would just pretend they got it and do a bad job, right? Until you got mad at them and then having them again or fire them or whatever was the outcome. Instead, they could watch that video a thousand times if they needed to until they got it, right? Until they understood how to do that thing you wanted them to do. We found that the written and the video really works for our team. Now, you mentioned the kinesthetic one. Maybe in other teams, you need to have them do other things. And maybe that's important for, for that group of people. For my people... And we tend, I don't know why this is, we tend to have a lot of introverts uh, in my organization that are really happy to just be left alone and read it or watch it on their own time. And then let me know if they have questions. 
Certainly, I would think that remote work lends itself best to people who are introverted for exactly those reasons. Because as you were talking, I was thinking, what would be a kinesthetic application yeah. <laughs> for someone who is really e extroverted? And I, the only thing I can think of would be, and it's not even entirely kinesthetic, but would be the live calls. Right. So live trainings or, or communicating with other people would be the closest thing to what an extrovert would perhaps need to have that live interaction versus an introvert who would prefer to just go back and watch and rewatch a video or read and reweed uh, some, some trainings in that way. Yeah. And I will say extroverts do really well in remote environments as well. However, there's a couple things that are a little bit different for them. Um, you know, the first is I, we actively coach our extroverts that, hey, you're going to have to have your social outlet. Some of the energy that you get from being social, you're going to have to go and recreate it somewhere else. So you're not going to get as much of it at work as you would in an office if you're in, you know, working in the office. You need to go and join a club or go to an extra networking event every week or whatever it is you need to do. If you need a certain amount of hours of like, I'm around people cool. You just got to put it somewhere else, right? Because it's not going to happen as much at work as you were, as you're used to. Number two, though, extroverts tend to be far more productive in remote environments because yes, they like people and yes, they like to talk, but they like to talk too much and they get stuck in too many conversations <laughs> and they get, they, their productivity goes down. So I am a card carrying extrovert and I'll tell you, I love remote work because I can sit and work for four hours and no one bugs me and I can get my stuff done. I'm really happy because I feel like I was productive, even though then I need to go have two hours at a networking event to, to recharge. I can do that, but I'm not, I mean, I have a sales guy and he was, he was a, he was a good salesperson for us and we were all in one office. He is my best salesperson now because he's at home and he is, he would talk to a statue. This man talks nonstop, <laughs> right? And so removing him from being around so many people made him more productive. And, and he recognized that, right? And so he understands, I can get so, I, I'm now talking to clients. If I'm in human interaction, I got to get people on the phone and talk to them. Great. That's great for selling. So it's just about knowing who your people are and then creating the right environments for them. I, I don't know if you do the TikTok at, at all, but there's been some really funny TikToks about, People have, you know, you know, welcome to the team. Would you, are you an, int you want to sit on the introverted side of the, of the company or the extroverted side? And it's like really funny, like how they differentiate that. And I realized we kind of already have that here in the remote space because of the way we create things, the introverts can kind of clump up to where they're really happy and the extroverts can clump up to where they're happy. And there's a good amount of crossover that they can still communicate and work together really well. And what I'm hearing here is, is ultimately the, the secret sauce is in intentionality. Really it, for extroverts, again, creating a space where they can intentionally be productive and will not be distracted in a way that they might be if they were in an office and someone came in and now suddenly they're talking and they've lost that productive time that they had scheduled for themselves. So that intentionality of creating productive spaces as well as recognizing the different work styles and personalities of all your employees and being able to provide advice and various environments and tools to allow them to be the, their ultimate selves and as productive as they possibly can be. I will say the one thing that I miss the most from working in an office was you know, I might be on my way to the copy room and I walk by accounts payable. I have no business with accounts payable, but I stop briefly and I have that conversation with Sylvia because she's there. And over the days, weeks, months, and years, I've get to know these people uh, in who I might not necessarily have any other reason to be in touch with, except that we are in the same office environment together. I guess it's the proverbial water cooler. You're, you're at the water cooler chatting with different employees in the office. And although that might not quite be considered billable work from an employer perspective. In my opinion, it really increased the cohesiveness of the team and the company as a whole and created that company culture that really could help the company as a whole and the team as a whole move forward. Now that water cool cooler culture is difficult to replicate remotely. How do you create that cohesiveness with a team remotely? So I actually think that what you're describing is good, but there's actually a better version of that. And so we do we do two things um, that's important. The first is we have a water cooler room in Slack. So we have a place <laughs> where people can intentionally bump into each other. They share 
I'll give you an example. Like, you know, the day after Halloween, uh, we had everyone sharing pictures of themselves or their kids, right, in their costumes and what they did for Halloween. And so there was this opportunity for everyone, not just you and Sylvia, to have an interaction, right? But now everyone can see those interactions. And so we actually magnify that instead of it just being what happened to you and Sylvia, it's now what happens to you and Sylvia and everyone else in the company inside of this room. We all get to share. We all get to see it. And so we kind of magnify that that outcome. Now, the second part is you're sort of saying, well, I'm able to maybe have some strategic conversation. I'm able, maybe able to see what she's working on. Maybe I would not have ever noticed that she's working on this one project that I could help her with if I hadn't walked by her office and things like that, right? So we... Yeah. We do ask people so to be self self selecting on to our groups and onto our teams, our our temporary teams. So we don't, as senior leadership, say, "I think these five people should go and pick a new CRM for us." We go to the entire company and say, "We are thinking about a new CRM. Who would like to be on that team?" And that allows people from all different parts of the organization to say, "That's interesting to me." I have had experience doing that. And so we do end up with a team where there's a salesperson, an accounting person, a customer service person. We get people that end up being on a team that can cross-pollinate across the the organization and share about what they're doing and what they're working on so that they get those opportunities in a much more directed way. And again, it's not just two people. It's now five people or seven people that are having that interaction. So we're sort of magnifying or, or multiplying that 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 outcome. Um, the, the last thing that we do is we have a, a very specific meeting types. And I don't know if you, if I, if I tell you all of our meeting types, uh, we'll be out of an hour here pretty quickly. But the most common meeting we have at our company is called the cockroach meeting. So a cockroach meeting, if you have a cockroach in your bathroom, it's a small problem. You may not want to be the one who cleans it up, but it's one problem. It's one cockroach, one problem, right? So anyone in the company can call a cockroach meeting. So they have the ability, anybody, day one, your first day at at my company, you can call a cockroach meeting and you can invite any five to six people you want. So it can't be more than seven people on the call. You can invite the CEO. You can invite the head of sales. You can invite someone in IT. You can invite anybody you think can help you with whatever it is that your, your cockroach, what your one problem is. No one in the company has to come. It is totally optional for you to attend a cockroach meeting. We just ask that you, if you can't come, you decline so we know you can't be there. And the meeting is 15 minutes or less, always starts on time. We always try to end early and must only be about one agenda item. The last time I surveyed my team a couple months ago, we do an average of 35 cockroach meetings a day across the organization. So they are constantly popping in for seven to eight minutes on average saying, hey, I got this The client called. This is the issue. So instead of them doing what you were talking about, walking down the hall and having one-on-one conversations and bumping along like a pinball, trying to trying to maybe figure out what I'm supposed to do about John at XYZ company who has this thing for me, instead, we're intentionally bringing those people together. You know, maybe someone in accounting, someone in customer service, maybe that salesperson who originally created the deal, uh, maybe my manager, let's get in. They ask for this. How in the heck do we make that happen? Right? Ah, we had this happen once before. You need to do this, this, this. Or we had this happen before. We cannot do that. We've been told, Chris has said, absolutely not. That's legal to do. We need to go back and communicate that. And they, in seven to eight minutes, they communicated across the organization, right? They got their problem solved and they didn't have to bump around and have one-on-ones all day long to try to maybe come up with something that maybe is or is not the right solution or that anybody else kind of knowing what they're thinking. So there is a better way to do it. It just takes a lot of, to your point, intentionality to create and, and design that how we want people to operate inside of that remote space. That is fantastic. I'd never heard of a concept like that. I think that that is amazing. And how many meeting types did you say you have in, to- uh, in there's, entirety? It was, uh, well, there's, so there's cockroach meetings, ostrich meetings, tiger team meetings, and tsunami planning meetings. Those are our far most common. <laughs> then we have stand-ups and we have the, the things you would typically you know expect inside of a team environment. 
but those out those four are the ones that have the funny names that have very special rules that people know what to what's going to happen right cockroach meaning you know you're coming to help them solve a problem ostrich meeting it's all the same thing it but 15 minutes and all that but you know you're coming to help teach someone something so if you don't know how to do an excel formula who in the company knows how to make a formula that does this thing in excel ah i do and two or three people or i don't know how to do that but i would love to learn that too i know that you're going to have that meeting i'm going to pop on because i want to learn too Right. And so people can get can can educate themselves and learn as they're going along if they're interested, because there's the visibility we're saying, who wants to help me learn this thing? Right. So that creates a lot of intentionality. The tiger team meeting. Imagine there's a tiger in your bathroom. It's a lot bigger problem than a cockroach. Right. So you would need a dart gun, tranquilizers, you know, you need a animal control. Maybe you might need a crane to get it out or maybe seven or eight really strong people to help you carry it out once it, right? It would take a lot of coordination and, and effort and people to get a tiger out of your bathroom. And that's the same. If we're going to call a tiger team meeting, it could be an hour, it could be two hours, it could be all day. It could be on Zoom. We might even fly people in. It might be in person if it's that big of a deal, right? It's a We're going to land the million dollar client. We're going to lose the million dollar client. They're about to change the law that will totally radically change our business. Like what's this big thing we have to deal with? There's going to be a big agenda and you're going to definitely have an idea of what you're supposed to do and show up, show up prepared and have researched things and talk to other people. And you're going to show up to this big meeting again, five to seven people, and you're going to help, help us solve a gigantic problem. Right. Think about the energy and how you would approach a tiger team meeting if you were asked to come to one. And that typically is called by management, wouldn't be called by anybody. And and how that changes your focus, it changes your energy. Right. As opposed to, well, I'm just being asked to go in this little cockroach meeting. There's a tiny I'm just doing someone a tiny favor for seven to eight minutes. I can do that. Right. And then get back to my work as to, well, this is a big deal. I'm going to be on this meeting all day. I'm canceling all my calls. I cannot meet with anybody on Wednesday because Chris needs me to come and help with this gigantic problem. So the tsunami planning meeting is a fake meeting. And we do this once a month inside of every team that is a fi- uh, an infinite team. So your sa- teams that exist forever, sales team, marketing team, customer service team, things like that, not temporary teams. And we do it once a month, it's 30 minutes. And we give all all of our teams a fake topic. What would happen if there was a giant pandemic? What would happen if (laughs) uh, Chris got hit by a bus and was in a coma for six months? What would happen if Starbucks called us tomorrow and said, we need to give you all of our background checks starting next month? Like, what would we do? Like, you know, how would we handle these imaginary things? Now, why would I want to do that? First of all, it is amazing what ideas people come up with when it's a fake idea that you can implement for free anyways. Uh, Go back and ask your team what they would do with a million dollars and ask them to brainstorm that. If I said, you have a million dollars, you can do anything you want with it. Very rarely does anyone say, give everyone a piece of that money. We just will take the money and walk home. They always say, oh, we could do this thing and we could create this and we could... And usually most of their ideas are free or cost very little because you're getting them to think about things in a different way. But what we find inside the tsunami planning meetings is this creates psychological safety and helps us curate the meetings that it lasts all month. We get this energy. So people practice this disagreeing and arguing about a fake topic. They're less afraid to give their ideas because it doesn't, it's not a real thing anyways. And they recognize that my boss didn't get mad at me for disagreeing. No one yelled at me when I disagreed with them, or no one told me I was stupid when my I came up with this idea. And so their psychological safety has been created. And so all month, they're now doing great meetings with their teams and with different people because they have this fresh practice and confidence. I mean, if you did any sports as a kid, you spend 99% of the time practicing right? Most of sports is practice and and a little bit is showing up and actually performing. And yet at work, it is almost 100% performing and no practice, right? And so 
we said we need to have a way to practice good meetings. And the, the last thing that we do inside the tsunami planning is if we see there's something going on, right? A leader might recognize, I'm noticing that Jane isn't talking very much, or I notice that John is interrupting all the time, or I'm noticing that Kevin is like, that guy needs to shut up. Like he is just talking and talking and talking, right? And like, and you're like, wow, okay. So as a leader, you can say, I need to go back and help those people. And I need to give them what we like to call feed forward. Instead of feedback, get rid of feedback. It's terrible. Give them feed forward. What I need from you in the next meeting is, so giving them future forward thinking direction. John, I noticed that you would, you know, in this last meeting, you were really excited. I really need you in the meetings coming up this month. Can you help me by listening twice as much as you talk? Can you make sure that you're not interrupting your team members? Let them finish what they're having have to say. It, I, what you have to say is important, but you let other people finish. And you, oh yeah, I can do that, right? And you start, you're curating these meetings. You're sort of like helping them and coaching them about, instead of having like an annual review going, well, John, in all of the meetings all year long, you pissed everybody off because you were always interrupting. How good is, that doesn't help, right? We need to tell them right away what we need from them. And that sets the stage for all of our other meetings being successful. I'm assuming that people can dive even deeper with uh, into all of these different meeting types and how to hold them in your book. Is that correct? correct. Absolutely. Yes. Very good. Okay. And we're definitely going to link to the book uh, in the description and the show notes wherever you're watching or listening or reading to this interview. There are a lot of viewers here or listeners here who work remotely. They have remote jobs. They want to take their jobs abroad. They want to travel long-term while working yeah. remotely, but they're scared to ask their employer for permission to work abroad for fear that their employer is going to say no. What would you say to someone who's in that position? If you really think it's going to be problematic, um, but you think you can do your job anyways, sometimes it's better to ask for forgiveness than permission. <laughs> Um, that would be the first thing I would say. All right. You know, it's like if you can do your okay. job and like you're willing to work the hours when you need to work the hours and that's like maybe you have to work at night while you're in London. Uh, so no one knows like it's not really their business. I mean, there, there's that there's that one perspective, right? Like go do what you want to do as long as you figure out the legal, you know, and ramifications and all that with being paid. Not If that all makes sense. I mean, I'm not an expert on that part of it. Um, but, you know. I know lots of people that that's just what they do, right? And they just going and asking HR, is it okay if I go work in London? It just sort of kind of can cause a whole other problem. Now, if you think that they would definitely like be really mad at you and fire you or whatever, if you didn't communicate, then yeah, I, I think what you need to do is what I have seen really work really well is to say, listen, I don't, I love my job. And I don't want to leave, but I really need to be in this other place for a period of time. Would you mind if we try this as an experiment? Would you mind if we gave this, a, you know, three months or six months to see how it goes and we reevaluate and if it's not working, I'll come back, right? To give the employer a lots of options and lots of the ability to say, I just want to try this out, right? And if it doesn't work out, well, then you can figure something else out. But typically it does work out. They don't notice any, all their fears didn't come true and they're just fine. It does help if they're a big, bigger company that maybe already has a footprint in maybe the country or the place that you want to go. So they already have the legal sort of setup. If you're talking about working for a small organization that only has an office, let's say in California, I mean, I've had people that did want to work abroad. And if they, it was a temporary thing, it was totally cool by me. I have at it. But if they were going to permanently reside there, we had issues like we didn't know how to handle some of the legal and compliance stuff, right? And so we had to think about how to recreate that in, that um, that 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 exchange, that relationship with that person. Did they need to continue to be an employee? Could they become a contractor? Could they work under someone else's? Thing? And, you know, there was lots of you know really creative ways that we could help them handle that based on where they were going. But we just didn't have any like legal way to pay them if they were in England, let's say. Right. And so you have to just sort of work through those complexities. The, the larger the company, the more likely they are to have some of those resources and abilities to do that. And they're probably also the more likely to say no too. But um, yeah, I, I say it's, it's good to have a two pronged plan, meaning 
should be looking for someone who you can work for in that place that you want to be while at the same time negotiating that with your current company. So you kind of have a little bit of leverage and you have a backup plan, right? If that company says no, you can still go and go work for that other one. And if they say no, you can, you know, you have to stay here. Go, oh, okay, I already have another job. Um, in this market right now, a lot of companies are you know, jumping through hoops to help people stay. And, and if all you need is a relocation, it should be pretty good. So, and especially if you've already proved yourself to be a good remote employee, you're kind of already halfway there. Um, it, it's probably figuring out most of the legal compliance stuff is the biggest issue. That's certainly my understanding that the biggest obstacle from an employer perspective is if you have more than a certain number of employees working at a certain geographic location, then that creates a whole new set of tax liabilities for the company. And like you say, this is their murky waters uh, legally to navigate as an employer, especially if you're a smaller company trying to figure out what's allowed and who's where and what, and are they living there? Are they just visiting? What's the difference? How long can you visit before you're considered a resident? All of that sort of stuff can be very complicated, which I'm assuming would be one of the reasons why an employer would just go, no. But I'm also wondering from an employer perspective, do you notice any differences between managing a remote team that is all in the same city versus this, across the state versus across the country versus across multiple countries and time zones? Are there differences for you as an employer, as a remote team manager, and how do you manage those differences? So the differences that are, I think, universal are how you work asynchronously. So that is an issue. You have to figure that out and be very intentional about can this person work async? Do they have to work at the same time that everyone else is working at headquarters or you know whatever your standard time zone is? Um, it's pretty hard. More than five time zones tends to get a little bit sticky. Um, you go six time zones and it starts to become like people are real, on the same team. It, it's really difficult to manage sometimes if they need to be collaborative. Now, if they're doing work that's independent and yet they're just kind of communicating with each other. Like I have a research team and they could do their research any time of the day, anywhere in the world. It doesn't matter as long as they're just keeping up with each other about what, what they've done and what they haven't done inside our Slack room. They're fine. Customer service, that would be a whole nother ball of wax, right? That would be totally because they would have to work <laughs> when my clients would typically be calling in. If they're okay with that. Sure. I'm okay with that. Um, if they're not, and they're going to try to answer tickets at three o'clock in the morning, well, that's not really going to work. So it does depend on the job and what's happening. But that is assuming that you're talking about hiring people who are generally, um, so you're, let's just say you had a, a company that you started in Toronto, you guys went remote, and then some of those people from Toronto decided they were going to go live in different parts of the world. Well, those people are from the same place, speak the same language, have a lot of the same cultural values. That's very different than saying, I'm a company in Toronto, and now we're going to go hire people in London, and we're going to hire people in to the Philippines, we're going to go hire people in Australia. And so you've added in the complexity of totally different values, cultural uh, norms, uh, language, right? And so that changes the game too. You have to think about what you're, what you're really talking about here because i've i've seen it where the easiest to me is hey i'm john who i know because he w lives two blocks away and even though he works remotely has decided he wants to go live in tanzania for two years cool go make it happen right we'll we'll work with you that's totally different than me hiring someone in tanzania right and having to figure that out so you have to you have to decide what it is you're going to do. You've definitely laid some amazing foundations here for remote work from an employee and employer perspective, forms of communication, ways people can replicate the water cooler in even better ways than what exists in a traditional office environment. And then, of course, what it is to manage and work across time zones, countries and cultures. Do you have, no pressure, any final piece of advice that you would like to impart to people who are remote workers and or remote employers? I would say that, you know, remote work is kind of is a part of our future. And, and one of the uh, silver linings of COVID was that it probably fast forwarded us by 25 to 30 years. 
right, of acceptance. I think it was going to take a really long time to get a, a, a generational shift. It was going to take, you know, a whole bunch of people retiring and leaving the workforce for remote work to finally have a a real stake. And now that we've done it and ev- almost everyone went and practiced it and realized it was it was great or they could handle it or they could manage it or it wasn't that much different, right? We fast forward it really rapidly. Um, so think about how your organization or how you as a person can continue to leverage this in a way that is beneficial for the organization and the company, I'm sorry, and the, and the employee um, to have better outcomes going forward. Because for us, it allowed us to grow faster. It allowed us to hire people in places we never could have hired, right? It allowed us to, to afford people we could have never afforded. Because honestly, a CMO in Kansas does not cost what a CMO costs in Los Angeles, right? There's different costs of living. There's different expectations, a different competitive market. So we could hire different people. Like, and it also allowed us to hire people that maybe we would have never hired before. And what I, and I mean that in several, lots of different ways. It helped us be a far more diverse company by expanding who and where we hired from. Um, it ex- allowed us to hire different groups of people that we would have never thought about hiring that w- turned out to be fantastic. One, uh, one example is we discovered that spouses of military enlisted military folks had a very difficult time being employed or staying employed. Because if their spouse got redeployed to some other base or some other country, they would lose their job. And if, Typically, people knew not to hire the spouse of a military person because they knew they'd probably lose them in three months. They'd do all this training and they would lose them in three months, right? We didn't have that problem. We were like, go go wherever you need to go, right? You can live on a base and that's different. Legality-wise, that's different. You're living on a base. That's America. That's considered a part of like... So we didn't have to worry about wherever they were. Go wherever you want to go as long as it made sense with the time zones like for your job. So we could hire a lot of... incredible people, absolutely brilliant people with degrees and like just smarter than anyone you've ever met that couldn't get a job just because of their their situation. Um, we've been able to hire very neurodiverse people uh, who cannot handle being in an office for long periods of time because of their anxiety, because of maybe they're on the um, autism spectrum, whatever that may be, like they could not function long-term in a traditional setting. And yet with us, they flourish. They do great because they don't have to deal with some of the things that are a challenge for them. So we've been able to like use this as our superpower. And I'm I'm happy to see other companies will be able to use it as their superpower. A little, I'm, I'm a little bit worried we'll lose some of our you know, it's nice to have this untapped superpower that no one knows about, but now everyone kind of knows about it. But I think it's good for society. It's good for the world. It's good for people in general. So I'm happy to share it. Um, but there's so much that remote work can give to everyone involved um, for a lot of jobs, not all jobs, but a lot of jobs. And that can really help us, I think, as a, from a global society standpoint, be, be better. Well, and you are a pioneer in this industry. You are a thought leader in this industry, and you are helping people adopt remote work in productive ways uh, around the globe. So thank you for that. And where can people find you? They can find me at uh, chrisdyer.com. You're welcome to connect with me on LinkedIn if you want to find me there, or I'm on all the other social platforms if you prefer one of those. But I think uh, LinkedIn is probably the area where I do the most uh, talking. And on my website, there's Lots of great resources. In fact, as a a gift to anyone who's listening, if they want to take my online remote leadership course, they can get half off by using the code CD50. Um, Just that's just secret for your for your people. So if they would like to do that, they are welcome to do it. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. I'll definitely include that code along with the links to your website, your social, and of course, your book in the show notes or description. So please, everybody have a look for that. And while you're there, Pick up your free checklist of 10 things to do before you travel long term so you can take your remote job abroad and make sure that you've got all your bases covered in so doing. Thank you so much, Chris, for joining me today. My name is Nora Dunn. I'm otherwise known as the professional hobo, and I will catch you next time. 